Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this week we have Marco who will tell us about locally maximum closed rain orbits. Mm -hmm. Thanks all for reminding me of these. It's so happy to be back. Uh, and last time I spoke here was 10 years ago. And so yeah, it's so great to come here. Um, yeah, so it's um, the talk is based on joint work with Herman Cinelli, who probably most of you know is a postdoc in Paris, and then Victor Ginsburg and Bajar Borel. So it's a talk about rev dynamics. And I will present what I uh, what is sometimes called a force existence result. First, it's a kind of force existence result. Distance. Yeah, so these are results of the following kind. You say the existence of a certain kind of orbit for a dynamical system, usually a symplectic dynamical system, existence of a suitable orbit implies the existence of infinitely many closed orbits. You mean force or force with a D? Force the. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, so a few examples of this, just to put it perhaps our results into context. I have to go back in time. Perhaps the first uh, uh, example would be uh, whenever you have in a, for diffeomorphism, a transverse uh, homoclinic. <clears throat> uh, of a fixed point, transverse homoclinic points in Y of a fixed point, of a fixed point X for certain diffeomorphism. So that's a fixed point. There's a he has a of a, of a hyperbolic fixed point. Uh, your hyperbolic fixed point, you have its stable manifold, unstable manifold, and these two happen to intersect transversely. And so that's your homoclinic point. And when you have an intersection like this, you have a a really hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic mass, really. Uh, and uh, you have the hyperbolicity in this picture that allows you to run symbolic dynamics and find, uh, and find plenty of uh, periodic points of the Hamilton and the field. So this is very, very classical. Uh, it goes back to the beginning, really, of dynamical systems. And it, it applies to diffeomorphisms in general. Now, let's move to symplectic dynamics. Here's uh, a beautiful result due to Victor Bungert, another kind of forced existence of completely different nature. Although there are, so it's not based on hyperbolicity this time. But once again, when you have this homoclinic, you have infinitely many periodic points. Now, let's move to symplectic dynamics. Let's take a closed Riemannian manifold, for instance, uh, a surface, draw it. Uh, I write a little weird so that to emphasize that I'm not making any assumptions here on the curvature or anything. Perhaps it has genius. And it doesn't have to be a surface, it could be a higher dimensional uh, manifold. So assume that uh, there exists, if there exists a closed geodesic, which is of waste type, waste, uh, so waste is like a waste. Uh, on the body. So, say for instance, you have a small mushroom here, and that's your waste. Yeah. And uh, the, just a simple, it's a closed geodesic, right? It's like a net. Uh, so, the existence of a waste imply a uh, contractible waste. Contractible means that you can deform the circle onto a point. So, the existence of a contractible waste implies the existence. Of infinitely many closed geodesics. In this picture, you see that you have this waste, it's contractible. 
in the picture, you can recognize that you have some kind of a hip here, which is another closure disc. But you have more. You have closure discs which are more complicated and cannot actually be described explicitly because the, the proof is a very awesome proof. They're indirect. And then I want to give another one last example. Uh, it's due to Nancy Hinkson. And uh, so Nancy proved it for, uh, for Tori, and then it's been extended later on by Victor Ginsburg. More general symplectic manifolds. Uh, it says that, so this was general dynamics. These are geodesic flows. This is for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So you have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, phi H1, of some symplectic manifold. Let's say that this is a closed, a spherical symplectic manifold, for instance, a torus. Uh, so this is the time one map of a Hamiltonian flow that's not autonomous. And the forced existence theorem, in this case, it's a pretty remarkable theorem, much harder than the one of Barnard. I don't know if Nancy agrees, but uh, I find much harder than, than that one. And the theorem says that the existence of a certain kind of fixed point for this diffuse, which nowadays is called the symplectically degenerate maximum. I think Nancy called it differently. Uh, symplectically degenerate max. So this is a particular kind of fixed point, phi h. And uh, you can give the definitions as an abstract definition, but one way to think of it, it's almost like the, the general definition. Uh, you know, this is a thermal map of a Hamiltonian flow. You can take a Hamiltonian such that, which is time dependent, say HT, such that Z is a critical point of HT. And it's actually a maximum of each, H, uh, of each uh, function HT, so all times T from zero to one. So you have maximum drawing the graph of the Hamiltonian. And it's kind of, a, it's, it's a very flat maximum, for instance, because all derivatives vanish at this point, but it doesn't have to be the case, but that would be good enough. Now, the existence of something like this implies the existence of infinitely many periodic points. Infinitely many periodic points. Another examples of results, just to give a context to our statement. And you can say more here. You can also say something about the periods sometimes. Um, right, so. Uh, the theorem that I will present would be a forced existence result, and the forcing comes from a locally maximal closed orbit. So let me remind the concept, although I'm mostly experts here. So, uh, so local maximality is a property that you can associate to a, a, a compact invariant set of any dynamical system either diffeo or flow. Let's say, let's do it for a flow, and later on it will be a red flow. So look at the maximal invariance on the subset. So I have my, my flow, I call it psi t, on a space, which I call m, because I think of, it, think of a manifold, though it doesn't have to be a manifold for this notion to be defined. The flow is psi t. And you have an invariant set, lambda, it's a subset of M. That's invariant by the flow. So it's equal to psi t of lambda, or t. And it's compact. It's compact. Invariant set. Definition. Lambda is locally maximal. Look, max. When? When it is the uh, largest invariant set on some neighborhood. So when there exists a neighborhood, U of lambda, you know, uh, such that lambda is in. What I call inv of u, 
This is the largest invariant set in U. In formulas, it would be the intersection over all times of psi t of u. And in the picture, so if this is your invariant set, for instance, a point for flow, um, there exists a sufficiently small neighborhood u. And if you take any point in the neighborhood that's not in lambda, the orbit through this point uh, needs to leave the neighborhood in the future or in the past, perhaps in both. So at this point, the orbit of the flow uh, flows out, both in the future and in the past. Some other points perhaps will be will stay trapped into the neighborhood, say in negative time, but then in positive time they will need to leave. And some other points will stay trapped in forward time, but they will need to leave in negative time. This is local maximality, very classical. I believe uh, you might go back to Kali or perhaps even before. An example of local maximum here in sets, a hyperbolic fixed point or a hyperbolic periodic orbit of a flow. Oh, this is the assumption that I will consider. And now the flows that will be considered. So it will be red flows. So uh, the geodesics of a closed Riemannian manifold parameters with unit speed are, or are orbits of a red flow on the unit tangent bundle. But here I will, be, I will consider red flow on standard convex spheres of any dimension. Standard convex spheres, S2 n minus one, equipped with uh, uh, the convex form, such that the contact distribution is standard. Yes, it's not, these are not geodesic flows. So the, the, the flows, uh, the red flows that I will consider are not geodesic flows. And standard context spheres will not, uh, most of you know it, without loss of generality, you can realize it as a star shaped sphere in R1. Shape, say, star shaped with respect to the R. So that's your, let me call the sphere M. So if you, this sphere can be realized as a star-shaped sphere in R2N. So all the radial lines intersect the sphere exactly in two points and transversely. And uh, uh, the contact, when you realize the sphere this way, contact form is, uh, you can take uh, x dy minus y dx, this contact form. Sum of xi dyi minus yi dxi, where xi yi are the coordinates in R2. And any standard convex sphere can be put in this form. Um, so, standard convex sphere, or any contact manifold has, a, uh, has its red flow, with psi t, it's the red flow. And it's uh, generated by the red vector field generated by a vector field R, defined by the usual equations, lambda of R equal to one, and D lambda of R equal to zero. Before we go oh, on too much, can I ask a very simple question? Please. Um, so is the neighborhood U, is, is, a diff, is there a difference between a locally maximal invariant set and an isolated invariant set? No, it's just synonymous. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, Conley perhaps. U would be the isolating neighborhood? Yes, uh, yes. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, I believe in Conley theory, the, the terminology it's used. Yes. Thank you. Right, so. Um, So these are the red flows that we consider, and not general red flows of spheres. Uh, there are very different, there, there, are, there are many open questions about red flows and spheres, even when even in the special case when the sphere is convex. And uh, actually, that's the case we had in mind uh, for the result that we present. But let me tell you the uh, precise assumption. Actually, not very precise. The assumptions that I will more or less make. Um, so first assumption, which I will make sometimes and sometimes not, is a common assumption in, in uh, rough dynamics is non-degeneracy, or not always needed. 
So non-degeneracy, well, and this audience uh, almost everyone knows, but um, it's it's a it's a condition that holds for its infinity generic sphere like this. So you can wiggle the sphere and you have this non-degeneracy. And it means that the closed orbits are non-degenerate. So if you have, uh, whenever you have a closed orbit, say, whenever you have Z, which is equal to Psi tau of Z, for some tau positive, you have that the linearization, the Psi tau at Z minus the identity, so the, the eigenspace of the eigenvalue one, uh, so the kernel of this, is generated by the right vector field. Particularly when you perturb that you have a non-degenerate closed orbit and you perturb, uh, the orbit will survive, will be perturbed as well, but will still be there, it will be stable. This is the first assumption, we're not always needed. So tau is not necessary, the minimal period. Right? Not the minimal, right, not the minimal, right. Could be also, yeah, I really want that the eigenvalues Right. Uh, of these are not roots, complex roots of one. Right, right. And it's infinity generic in, in lambda or in the hypersurface if you, if you realize it this way. Second assumption, which is also uh, quite well known since the work of Helmut, uh, it's dynamical complexity. Dynamical complexity. And as I said, what I, have in, what I had in mind was really convex spheres, and the result that I will present would be new for convex spheres. But then once we had the old proof, then we realized what the minimal assumptions are, and it's, the result it's dynamical convexity tish, which is less than, less than the full dynamical convexity. So uh, if you don't want a technical statement, think of a convex sphere, so M convex. And that's good enough, and that's always what I have in mind. So M is really something that looked like this, with the origin enclosed. For the experts, uh, for the expert, you, you we can use what uh, how much called the uh, and then together with Chris Wisolski and, 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 and Sender called dynamical complexity, which is uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to a uh, weaker assumption. As I go down, so one would be weaker than two. Sorry, stronger than two. Um, um, so second, second kind of dynamical convexity assumption is the proper dynamical convexity that says that for every closed orbit, gamma of the red flow, so from gamma zero is equal to z, and that's equal to psi t of z. Uh, every closed orbit comes with a certain index uh, called the Conley Sender index, and we'll denote it by mu. Sometimes it's called the Maslow index. And for geodesic flows, it's also the usual uh, Morris index, shifted by a, perhaps a dimension of the manifold minus one. Um, every closed orbit has index at least n plus one, where n is the the end of the previous dimension of this. Um, actually, I will not need all this. In, uh, if, if I really want to write down the minimal assumptions I need, it would be enough to require this dynamical convexity only for the orbits with average index positive. For those of you who are, who are familiar with the average index, probably most of you, and if you're not, just, just forget about it. Think of the common sphere anyway. Uh, and uh, third assumption, and even weaker, than two, uh, and it would be enough for one of the two statements that I will give is simply that every closed orbit, for all closed orbits, gamma, the index of gamma uh, is at least three or even a little bit less. So max is at least three or two plus uh, what I call. Uh, new of gamma, um, and new of gamma is the uh, half dimension, is the half dimension, half dimension of 
the generalized eigen space of the eigenvalue one of the Fluke multiplier one. Let me explain in words. So let's say that this closed orbit starts at point zero. It has period tau. And then you look at uh, the psi tau of z, you look at its eigenvalue one, and you want, you call the new of gamma, the generalized, the half dimension of the generalized eigenspace of one. The generalized eigenspace is a symplectic vector space, so it has even dimension. We can divide by two. I cannot give a sense to this. It just comes out of the proof. Uh, and once again, this is good. Think of, think of convex for the zero. <laughs> Um, perhaps I leave the assumptions up there. Uh, write the statement here and then continue elsewhere. Uh, so here's the main theorem in collaboration with my co authors. So we don't have a single statement that's stronger. We have a, a couple of related statements, none of which imply the other, but almost. So, first statement, which is perhaps my favorite. Uh, so, assume. So we are in a sphere of this kind. Assume uh, non-degeneracy. And assume uh, this dynamical convexity, so the, the, the proper one, the ordinary one. And so these are the working assumptions. And then the real assumption is there exists, so assume non-degeneracy two and the existence of a locally maximal. Uh, closed orbits for the red flow. Yeah. Then there are then it supports in theorem. So then there exist infinitely many closed orbits. Infinitely many closed orbits. And it, it's actually interesting to read the contrapositive of this statement. So if you have a red flow from these kind of spheres with only finitely many closed orbits, it's kind of like a pseudo rotation version for flows, <laughs> version for flows. If you have only finitely many closed orbits, none of these orbits is isolated as invariant sets. So there are non-trivial uh, compact invariant sets around the orbits. And so it's perhaps, perhaps nicer to read the contrapositive. And uh, as I said, this is not the, um, the stronger. We cannot prove something stronger than this, but we can prove a variation of this. So we relax some assumption and, and strengthen other ones. And uh, say, and the genesis, I kind of don't like, you know, I, I like both geodesics very much. And there, there's a lot of work. Um, a lot of work has been done to get rid of uh, non degeneracies. So I like to get rid of non genesis whenever I can. So. If you are possibly degenerate and uh, you don't have two, but you have the weaker three, so assume only three, but then I need something stronger. Then I need a locally maximum closed orbit, which is actually hyperbolic. Yeah. Yeah. Assume three and the existence of a hyperbolic uh, closed orbit. Once again, whenever I say two and three, think of convex. Think of a convex uh, sphere. It's, it's good. Uh, then, same conclusion. There exists infinitely many closed orbits. I should mention, I won't be able to give a detailed proof of this, of course, in any one hour, but I should mention that, you know, when one reads hyperbolic, think of hyperbolic dynamics, which is very strong assumption, you know, you can do uh, symbolic dynamics sometimes. Sometimes you find horseshoes and stuff like that. Here we don't really need the hyperbolicity. The, the, the only, um, so the hyperbolicity is only needed for the for what concerns the behavior of the indices. So, uh, so as soon as the closed orbits of indices that behave like in the hyperbolic uh, setting, we're good. So it's not really a statement about hyperbolic dynamics. So in dimension three, are there any examples of locally maximum? Right, that's actually quite a, uh, answer the question in a moment. 
you know, we didn't know, but then we learned from the experts. And, uh, well, I answer now, actually, in a bit. So let me give you the count. Perhaps I leave everything here and I erase from the left so that we can keep reading. So let me give you the context of this theorem, where it comes from, because it's not the first theorem of the kind. It's the first theorem of the kind for red flows. Um, we were trying to look for a few years. Finally, we could. But the war, um, so the theorem is inspired by earlier theorems uh, for Hamilton and diffeomorphisms. And to begin answering your question, uh, this theorem is new and relevant only in higher dimension, meaning that in dimension three, uh, the experts uh, knew this, although it's not written now. Yeah. Dimension three is always, as you, like, you know, it, it's, it's very special for graph dynamics, and dimension two is very special for Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, right, so, but there were a few things I didn't know and I learned. But in, in, higher dim uh, for, in higher dimensions, if you have only finitely many orbits, is, 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 can one say something about the entropy? It's kind of linear. It's kind of in, in dimension three, if you have topological entropy positive, then you have infinite right, I, orbits and so on. But, uh, uh, but I, 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 no, I don't think in high dimension. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, no, not to my knowledge, but but perhaps I'm. Uh, 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 I think here yeah, they're not present. So this is theorem of uh, mentioned three many things are special, right? Omri So Omri proved the smooth non-singular vector for a compact manifold in three dimensions. Then, if you have positive uh, entropy, uh, topological entropy, you have any yeah, but, yeah, because you have a hyperbolic, you have a, yeah, yeah. a horseshoe. But that's that's very special dimension. We, we were actually in contact with uh, uh, Sarig for other reasons, not for, us, not for this talk. But he explained to us all, all, all those things. And this thing you're mentioning, uh, Sarig uh, proved more than this. Prove uh, proved something about this horseshoe, which is more, uh, which is harder. And I'm not an expert on that. I cannot really tell. But this thing you're mentioning was already, I would say, folklore for the experts. Uh, and it really comes from a theorem, a major theorem of Katak for. Uh, uh, surface diffeomorphisms. So this is a flow version. We found, Sarig actually pointed out a, a paper of Lai Sang Yang from the uh, 2010s, uh, published in Jams, uh, where, where she, she proves what, what you said, just the, the plain statement that you said. Sarig proves more. In, in, Sarig finds a, yeah, I forgot what he does. He, he, he finds a horseshoe, and a, in a horseshoe, you have a shift of dynamics. We can say something on the alphabet, something that the experts were looking at. Or I guess. Um, yeah, but in any case, I would wonder if one, uh, I think we in synthetic geometry have never really studied the things with uh, suppose zero entropy. What can you say that? With zero entropy. Zero entropy plus some additional things, maybe. Really... Right, right. So so Victor Ginsburg started uh, this, this series of works on this barcode entropy. And yeah. I also uh, jumped in at some point. We did something about geodesic flows. Uh, but uh, yeah, we can say something about that entropy, but it's sometimes that entropy is the topological entropy in low dimension, mm -hmm. but uh, in general it's not. And it's, um, yeah, um, but I'm, I'm still very ignorant about entropy. I, I uh, yeah, I'm still learning about entropy. Uh, more questions on the statements? Yeah, so context. Oh, I have to move up my time already. Um, context. I mean, perhaps not waste much time on the context, but a little bit still also to answer your question. So in low dimension, um, so this theorem is inspired by analogous results for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And in low dimension, uh, uh, things were known since the early work of, uh, since uh, actually the celebrated work of Le Calvez and Yocas. So Le Calvez and Yocas have this, this remarkable paper in which they prove uh, that uh, there are no minimal homeomorphism of a punctured sphere. Punctured sphere is a sphere with finitely many points removed, and a minimal homeomorphism is a homeomorphism, all of whose orbits are dense. That thing doesn't exist on a punctured sphere. And uh, Le Calvez explained to us that one can localize the theorem and get this theorem out of it. Uh, say, uh, let's it for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, perhaps we can go a little bit beyond it. Not sure. So it's I still attributed to uh, like a Vesenio plots, but it seems to be something like 
yeah, it's, it's, it's really the code as your cause and it's not written down. So we wrote it in our paper. We wrote the details in our paper, but uh, it's something that the experts knew. So any Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, the one map of Hamiltonian flow on S2 um, with a locally maximal um, six points. Has infinitely many periodic points. Number of periodic points, right? Equal to n. And so it's I, I stake it for spheres because uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms for fluoride or, or or other surfaces always have unconditionally um, infinitely many periodic coordinates, periodic points. Nancy proved it for for a whole dimension even. Um, right, so, so this theorem was striking uh, to the experts. Uh, it seems it, it's in uh, uh, it seems to contradict the construction of of Anos, uh, of Anosov and Katok. So I write Vs. So Vs, this example of Anosov and Katok. Anosov and Katok. So Anosov Katok Katok proved that there exists a Hamiltonian D field of S two. With finitely many periodic points. And in that case, when there are finitely many periodic points, there are, there are only two. And they're both elliptic, near roughly elliptic. And only three ergodic measures. I write erg of phi for the ergodic invariant measures of phi. Only three of them. So it's a, it's a Hamiltonian diffus. So it, one measure that's certainly preserved is the syntactic form, is the one associated to the syntactic form. And the other two are the two associated to the, you know, the Dirac and the two fixed points, delta x, delta y. Now, if you look, if you look at this, uh, if you look at these two statements, they seem to be in contradiction. Meaning if you have only two periodic points, this theorem tells you that around any of these two periodic points, there are complicated invariant sets. In particular, there are orbits that stay trapped in a small neighborhood. So take one of those orbits and build the invariant measure supported on it. And this invariant measure is supported on a neighborhood of X. So you only have three measures, so it must be the Dirac uh, at the fixed point. So it means that the, these complicated invariant sets around the fixed points span more and more time closer and closer to the fixed point. It's something very subtle. Right. And uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I don't want to give you the proof, but it's a bit of a piece. There's a, there's a proof of this theorem uh, that was given by John Franks, and uh, that's very, very simple. Uh, so this was an analyst paper. Uh, they proved more than this in the, in the paper, uh, and more than what I said before. But John Franks uh, found that this theorem can be proved just with left fixed point theory and a bit of Conley theory. And uh, at the end, uh, you can this phi induces uh, linear endomorphism on a certain local homology. So if you assume you have only uh, finitely many periodic points and they're all locally maximal, then your, your D field phi induces some uh, induces some isomorphism on the local homology of each of these fixed points for a suitable notion of local homology. And for left shift fixed point theorem, left shift fixed point theorem implies that this isomorphism, so we'll call it A, if you iterate it, you take A to the M. For every M, A to the M has trace minus one. Now, a uh, great exercise for uh, linear algebra students. The matrix cannot have infinitely many powers with negative uh, trace. Uh, cannot have uh, all powers with negative traits. It's a cute proof somehow. I didn't know about it. Um, and the, uh, in the proof, what's hidden in the proof that goes uh, in the direction of your question is that an irrational elliptic uh, fixed point of a surface area preserving surface diffu is never locally maximal. Mm -hmm. Never ever. I don't know a higher dimension. Um, I didn't know even in dimension two, but I learned it from the Calvary. But in higher dimensions, you don't have this dichotomy like elliptic hyperbolic. That, that's also true, but it's a bit, sure. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you also have other orbits, but just this statement, I don't know if it's true in high dimension. So you don't know if an elliptic rate orbit is never a locally maximum? Uh, yeah, irrational elliptic in particular, yeah. I mean, yeah, in particular, I don't know that. Mm. Perhaps not other is would be. I don't think that something like that could be true in high dimension. So, um, so this is all of the context. Let me finish the context. So, and then, oh, already have games for it. So, uh, I raised Nancy, but not the moment can No, this one, Ralph. We brought in Ginsburg. Inverse order. In inverse alphabetic order. Um, so, in high dimension, ah, perhaps I should say, perhaps I say the words. Um, yeah, in on a, you can use this theorem and surfaces of sections, which nowadays we know they, they exist, um, um, to, to uh, infer that on a say on a let's say on a closed three manifold with a let's say at least a non degenerate rep flow, uh, if he has a locally maxima closed orbits, he has infinitely many closed orbits. And an outcome of that and surfaces of sections, whereas three, for instance, using the theorem of Helmut. We saw Kian saying that. Right. So in high dimension, Ginsburg and Gurel, sort of the theorem, which I really like, about uh, 12 years ago, perhaps. Uh, so it's down. So he proved this for CPN. So uh, any I um, CPN. Uh, which is a pseudo rotation, namely with uh, find, uh, with uh, let's say with a with a locally maximal fixed point. Or not, let me let me state the for positive. Any Hamiltonian DC of CPN with a locally maximal fixed point, fixed point has infinite invariants. Uh, the proof is uh, really different from uh, the low dimensional one. Has, uh, you can carry out this proof in low dimension as well. Um, but the proof is, is based on a, uh, was based on, uh, well, detailed analysis of the index and, on floor, uh, and of uh, floor cylinders uh, entering the floor homology of this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. And uh, for a few years, we've been trying to extend this to flows, and uh, finally we could. And, uh, that's a statement that I stated there. So let, let me let me tell you. I mean, I'll move to, uh, to the proof of our theorem. Uh, Twenty minutes shouldn't be too bad. Are there questions on the context? Most of you know the stuff, right? Just tell me if it's if it's. Uh, So the tool we use simple homology, not surprisingly. Main tool is simple homology. Of my sphere, did I raise the sphere? Yes, I did. So simple homology of R of my sphere. So this is the standard context here. Right, so symplectic homology, well, most of the people in this room are either experts or inventors of symplectic homology, so, uh, or both. Um, so uh, symplectic homology is an invariance that you associate to the to this con to, to a feeling of this contact manifold. I just write it as Symplectic homology of uh, our sphere. And later on, I would just, I would not denote the sphere anymore. So it's an invariant that comes, it's a set, it's a, it's a family of invariants. You have one for each interval i in R. And uh, it's also, it's a group, 
it's graded. And the grading, uh, yeah, with a really integer grading. So let me put a, let me put an integer here. B. So this is something that's generated, somehow generated by the closed web orbits. Closed web orbits that are on the sphere of period in the interval i and index meaning mass of index of comets and the index equal to d or d minus one. Okay, so that's the invariant that I'm going to use. Uh, surprisingly, I'm not using the S1 equivariant version of symplectic homology. So when you have a periodic orbit, it comes it's parameterization, you can shift the parameterization. So you have an S1 family of periodic orbits. They're all they're all the same geometrically, but formally they're different. And sometimes people like to quotient under this action, like Nancy did it first for geodesic flows many few years ago, many years ago. <laughs> yeah. And um, it usually gives a more a more refined invariant. But for this problem, we need the non-equivariant, oddly enough. Um, and this is uh this is defined as a direct limit of the floor homology group, which is something. Oops. So, floor homology group of a certain sequence of Hamiltonians. And this is a certain co final sequence of Hamiltonians. The details don't matter for, for this level of, of, of detail that I'm giving. But just to give, uh, perhaps it's important to keep in mind that this is something generated. By the one periodic orbits, one periodic orbits of uh, the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism uh, generated, one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian flow generated by H. And this H is a certain family of Hamiltonians in the ambient R2N. I remind you that your sphere is a star shaped. Actually, I write this convex because it's. As I said before, kind of dynamically convex. So your sphere is in R2N, it's contained in the ambient R2N. Here, these Hamiltonians are Hamiltonians in the old R2N. You can take Hamiltonians that extend in a suitable way the, the red flow on, 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 the, on, the, on the sphere M. And this is only generated by one periodic orbit uh, of. of Action in I and period and and an index, sorry, an index equal to a D or D minus one. So there we have period in I, here we have action in I, but somehow we can relate the two things. Uh, and uh, in the limit, we have the good the good invariant. If okay, you're not familiar with this, it doesn't matter for, for the rest of the proof. I'm just giving you the, the ingredients of it. Now, this is the tool, and uh, I'm going to need uh, three ingredients. Uh, this one of which was uh, uh, was already uh, well known in the literature, and uh, well, perhaps two of them were, were well known in the literature, and the third is new, and the blending of the three ingredients is also new and requires a bit of work. So, three ingredients. That I'm going to apply to syntactic homology. First ingredient, it's well known that uh, so this sphere is displaceable in R2N, meaning that there's a Hamiltonian that shifts the sphere away from itself. Uh, and whenever you have this, whenever you have a, a displaceable filling of a contact manifold in a certain ambient, the syntactic homology vanishes. In particular, for sphere, that's the case for spheres. The symplectic homology, uh, if, you, if, you, if you take the symplectic homology, you take for action in for of period, you take a period interval, the old real line, the symplectic homology then vanishes. So that was already known. Um, and the expert knew that uh, this has an implication on the barcode that you can create out of the symplectic homology, namely, this implies that there's a uniform uh, bound on the bars of the barcode. So without introducing the barcode terminology, let me state what it means. 
So this implies that there exists a constant C positive uh, such that uh, such that uh, for all intervals I in R, so the constant is going to be uniform on the intervals. Uh, if you take the symplectic homology filtered in I, and you take the symplectic homology, but you shift the interval by C. So if I is the interval AB, uh, this is the interval A plus C, B plus C. And you should think of this symplectic homology as some kind of Morse, uh, some kind of Morse theory, some kind of homology group of, uh, if you have interval AB, you have a certain Morse function, and you take the sublevel set B of the function relative to the sublevel set A of the function. So whenever you shift the interval to the right, you also have a map used by inclusion of sublevels. I think it's a good analogy, although in symplectic homology, of course, things are more, more complicated. And this map is zero. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that there's a natural map here that turns out to be zero. Right. Why I can shift to I plus C? Uh, well, you can shift why you have a map? To, yeah. So, so think of this as a, as a, so in most theory, when you have a function, you can take uh, the homology of the sublevel sets, say F less than B relative to F less than A. You can take its homology and think of this as uh, as this group, but instead of having a for for, the, for a certain uh, for a certain actual function, it's not it's not a, it's only an analogy. It's not exactly that. It's, it's more complicated. But now, if you, in, in more theory, you can certainly you certainly have a map from this to the same group where you shift the sublevel sets by a certain constant positive. Right. So this is included in this, and this is included in. F less than A plus C. Mm -hmm. So you have a map in just by inclusions. You have like inclusion on the chain level, which induces. You have a map among topological spaces, you have a map yeah. used in a model. And this is the, the, the symplectic homology equivalent of this. It's, it's uh, yeah. For floor homology, it's really, it's really that. Um, right. So 10, 10 minutes. Oof. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, yeah. So um, this, uh, um, so I learned it from, from Victor Ginsburg. He said he learned it from uh, Iria. I forgot what Kai said. So uh, Iria, I can trace uh, this, this to Iria. And uh, I don't want to erase the theorem, and perhaps I don't want to erase any. So perhaps I can start from up there. Yes, this was no dimension. That's okay. Yeah, so second ingredient. A well known symplectic dynamics. Uh, um, one can use indices to infer statements about the dynamics. So when you have a, a closed orbit, closed web orbit. Let's say this uh, will come with some period tau. You can, if it has period tau, you can look at it as a m tau periodic orbit for any integer m. You're simply taking like covering of the orbit. So I'm going to call gamma to the m the same orbit, but if this is period tau, you look at this as an orbit of period m tau, but geometrically they're the same. Okay. So this is the mth iterate of gamma. And one can study, so each orbit has an index. When you iterate the orbits, the index changes on the iteration. And uh, the function that sends the order of iteration to the index, it's very well studied. And uh, the second ingredient uses subtle properties of this map. Subtle properties. Um, I have 10 minutes. Perhaps I don't write the subtle properties in more details, but I can tell you either by voice at the end or, or after the, the 10 minutes. So that's um, because I prefer to finish the proof with that. These subtle properties are related to what uh, Yiming Long called the common jump index theorem. Uh, nowadays, we understand it a little bit uh, better, I think. Uh, it's it's uh, 
Victor called it uh, in some paper, index recurrence properties. Uh, it's uh, it's really an index version of the, of the Kronecker theorem. It's, it's um, I, I get back to that uh, at the end. And the third ingredient, which is really new in this setting, it wasn't new in floor theory. Uh, it's uh, what uh, what's called the uh, uniform. So it's a uniform crossing energy bound, which I'm going to illustrate with a picture. I'm going, to, I'm going to be a little bit sloppy here. Uh, I was talking distinctively of symplectic homology or of its floor or of the floor homology for a suitable age, as if they were the same thing. All our proof is is run with floor homology for a suitable uh, for an age that approximates well enough symplectic homology. But these are technicalities in the proof that uh, were a source of difficulty, but they're not the essence of, of, of the difficulty in the proof. So I'm going to give you a qualitative picture of this, of this statement. The uniform energy, energy crossing goes as follows. So as I said, this is uh, generated by periodic orbits. And that one as well, except that the period is one. So let's take a periodic orbit that generates, uh, that generates uh, uh, an element in here. So uh, I take my gamma, which is an element in the loop space of the, of the sphere, and more generally of the ambient R2 way. This is the notation that's sometimes used for loop space, the space of closed curves, in this case in R2 Okay. Um, now, let's say that this is, a, let's work in this picture. So let's say that this is a one periodic orbit of IH, IH T. And so this is a space of loops of period one. So perhaps I write a one here to the track of the period. Okay. And now, uh, and uh, number to the M, likewise, will belong to lambda M R N, space of M periodic loop. All right. So um, now the this uniform energy bound says that there exist. Um, uh, Right, so let's assume that this orbit is local maximum. If it's local maximum around the orbit, there are no other invariant sets. In particular, you can find an epsilon exists, an epsilon positive as a consequence of local maximality, such that uh, such that there is no orbit z zeta of my Hamiltonian system that stays epsilon close to gamma in a C0 topology, such that Z, zeta minus gamma to, you can put here really gamma to the M if you want. Well, let's say gamma, it's less than epsilon. Okay, so gamma is, a, is defined from time zero to one and then it repeats. So look at it as a, as a, as a as a curve from R to R to N. I'm just, I just rewrote the local maximality. Now let me write the uniform energy bound. The uniform energy bound goes as follows. So you have your orbit uh, gamma, which I draw as a point because I think of it as a point in the loop space. That's gamma. And for every M, gamma to the M, I look at it as a point in the loop space of n periodic loops. Okay. And now I take, uh, so the bound says that there exists a C0 neighborhood, which I call UM. So UM. UM is the set of uh, loops in the n periodic loop space such that, so this is M and this is N, and they're different. So M is this M, it's related to the order of iteration. So this is the set of loops that stay uh, epsilon close to epsilon close to gamma. So such that theta minus gamma to the M is less than uh, is less than epsilon. It's a C0 neighborhood of gamma to the M 
in the loop space of imperialic curves. And now, uh, floor homology is generated by one periodic coordinates, and the uh, binary operator is, is uh, found certain uh, floor cylinder, which are which we can think of as gradient flow trajectories in the loop space. So I'm going to draw a floor cylinder as a line. So a cylinder is a line in the space of loops, okay. and so I call this U, and the fluid cylinders, which are of interest in fluid homology, join the uh, periodic orbit with another one, perhaps this zeta. And the uniform crossing energy bound says that for every such U or cylinder, the energy of U, which is by definition the action difference in, between these two orbits, a of zeta minus A of gamma to the M. I take the absolute value because I don't know in which direction the cylinder goes. This is at least delta, and delta is a, is a constant. I should write there exists delta. Sorry for going a bit too nearly on the backward. So I insist this delta is independent of the order of iteration and of the flow cylinder. If you only wanted uh, delta depending on M, that would simply be a usual compactness argument for more theory or from or graph compactness for further large. Now, these are the three ingredients. And now I have two minutes left. Let me blend them together. But the blending is not, uh, uh, it's not straightforward. So you, you would, uh, if you ask me to fill in the old data, it's like uh, another hour or so. Um, but this conceptual, it's easy. So it's easy. Uh, 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 it's easy uh, to know what you have to try to prove. So, of course, proof of the main theorem. It has two points, but at this level of generality, the proof is the same for the two points. So take one or the other, or, or take the intersection of the two. Let's say that uh, let's assume by contradiction that there is a locally maximal closed orbit, but only finitely many uh, closed orbits. So by contradiction, there exists a locally maximal or a hyperbolic, if you prefer to put the other one. Uh, the proof is the same. Uh, closed orbit gamma, but only finitely many. Closed orbits. And now you run an you run a index argument. <laughs> So as I said in ingredient two, we know a lot, we know a lot about the properties of the index of iterated curves. For instance, we know that this function here is approximately linear. It would be not so hard to prove, but you can say a lot more than that. Raoul Bot already uh, basically found the, the general recipe for the for this function. And then uh, what well, that recipe in some arithmetic can be used to really write down statements about this function. And using that, um, so using ingredient two, we can prove the following thing. So we have our anomalous locally maximal closed orbit. It shouldn't be there because we only have finitely many closed orbits. Well, we can prove that there exists an order of iteration m large enough. So this is an integer. Such that the following happens. So for every other periodic orbit zeta, you know, floor homology is generated like periodic orbits, and the boundary operator uh, deals with 
orbits with index difference one among them. So for every other periodic orbit with index difference one from gamma to the m, so with uh, mu of zeta minus mu of gamma to the m. My time is up, but I'm almost done as well. Equal to one. So these are this is an orbit that could potentially cancel the contribution of this orbit in in, uh, in, in floor theory. So for every such orbit, we have that uh, the action difference between zeta and gamma to the m. I have to put an absolute value because I don't know if this orbit comes above or below in action. So, but this action difference, we can control it and prove that it's either small, less than the this delta that appeared in the in the uniform crossing energy bound, or uh, very large, in particular, much larger than uh, than uh, C, which I hope I didn't erase, was the C of the first, was this C here. The C is such that if you shift by C, you kill the syntactic homology. Let's say, simple, let's say larger than 4C. Now I claim that once you have this, the, the theorem is proved. And let me explain why. It's one minute and then I'm going to stop. Sorry for going slightly over time. You can see why the proof finishes. Let me state it anyway. So now you take your orbit gamma iterated m times so that you have this property called A the action of the orbit gamma iterated m times. Okay. And now uh, let's look at the symplectic homology uh, on action interval A minus, so this A minus. 2C, C is uh, this C here, uh, A plus 2C. And uh, let's shift it to the right by C. So SH, so there's a natural map that sends this to A minus C, A plus 3C. Okay? Now, oh, this is the natural map then by shift to the action interval, as we said before, and ingredient one says this is zero. Okay. Nevertheless, I claim that uh, gamma to the m is not zero here. Sorry. It's uh, not zero here, and it's also not zero here. Which would give a contradiction. Say briefly words why. So you have gamma to the m. Uh, so this is a cycle in here because if you take uh, if you take any other orbit that lies below in action and has index difference one, either this other orbit is action, action difference very small, but then by the crossing energy bound, it cannot be connected uh, to gamma to the m because every time you move away from gamma to the m, you spend energy at least to delta. We cannot say no delta. Or, or it has action difference very large, larger, much larger than C, in particular, that will exit. Uh, so in particular, the, the, the action of zeta will exit this interval. And so there's no flexi linear sending this uh, to another closed orbit with action interval, uh, with action in this interval. So this proves that this is the cycle, and the same argument proves that this cycle is not a boundary. And we can run the same argument here. That's sort of going to be the return. That was the proof. Questions? Um, I completely yeah. don't understand how. Do you got this? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, hopefully, because it's, it took us many years. I got it. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, so. Um, of course, I don't understand because I didn't explain it, uh, but um, perhaps I explain it a little bit more. And it's complicated enough that I wouldn't be able to give you the, uh, you know, to do the old exercise 
just in real time in front of you. I would get stuck and I would need to uh, play with my notes. But the, the, the essence of this is that you know the action behaves uh, really linearly with iteration. A is it a gamma to the m is m times a of gamma. And you know that you have only finitely many orbits. So any other orbits, well, call the finitely many orbits, uh, say gamma one, gamma n, and gamma one is your gamma that's locally maximal. Okay? So any other zeta is gonna be uh, an iterate of these orbits. So this, so the action grows linearly with the iteration. Uh, the index doesn't grow linearly, but it grows approximately linearly. This is almost linear. Now it's perhaps not so hard to believe that blending together these two, you can control what the action does when the index is small, when the index difference is small. I don't pretend uh, it's not a proof, but they're using these two facts. They're using the, the fact that I know more than than the, and this almost linearity. I'm only ask you if, if it's believable that you can go this way to prove it. I'm not asking you to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. figure out the, the, how to get it, of course. Okay. Um, can I ask a question? Please. Um, so just your bound um, epsilon of delta so presumably epsilon depends on at least two things. It depends on, uh, sorry, sorry, delta depends on epsilon. And it also depends on some C2 norms and it depends on the linearization, the eigenvalues of gamma. Depends on the epsilon depends on the local maximality of gamma. Yes, but then delta depends on a bunch of stuff. So uh, could you shape this, describe the dependence of delta on whatever other data, like at least approximately? Ah, uh, right, you want, no. No, um, no. I can tell you how the proof goes, though. So you, you sure. see why I cannot. So uh, assume that the. So as I said, you can think of a Floyd trajectory as as a. Well, you can think of a Floyd trajectory as a, as, a, as if, if you were a, a gradient Floyd trajectory for the action. So right. U is a Floyd cylinder, so it depends on S and T, solves the Floyd equation. But if you write these as U of S of T, where for every for every yeah. S, U of S is a loop. You can think of it as a so the floor equation becomes the gradient floor equation. So mm -hmm. U dot or dot with derivative with respect to S mm -hmm. equal to the gradient of the A dot to U. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now um, assume the if you assume you don't have this uniform bound. Okay. So then you find the sequence of cylinders asymptotic to gamma to the m from varying values of m that drops less and less energy as they cross, so say, a shell uh, within this neighborhood of, of gamma to the m. In particular, you're able to find the sequence. Not so sure. Right? Mm -hmm. In particular, you're able to find a sequence of iterates, mi, going to infinity. And a sequence of points, say in the neighborhood here, points like this, uh, let me call them ZMI, perhaps. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, not ZMI, let me call it, uh, yeah, ZMI. A sequence of points ZMI such that the gradient of the, of the action at Z, zeta MI, is very small. It's going to zero. Yep. Now, this is going to zero, so in particular, Tiny and being tiny means that this is almost a critical point of the action, so it's almost a periodic orbit, a very large period because it's close to gamma to the m. And uh, then you need some compactness argument to say that uh, zeta to the mi converges to a zeta, which is actually an orbit of the flow, but it's not periodic anymore, perhaps because you have a sequence of periodic orbits, periods going to infinity, it stays nearby, so you're able to recover some compactness. And uh, this really goes to zero in the limit. So this is kind of like a critical point of the action, but defined on infinite orbits, not on periodic orbits. So this is 
roughly speaking, I'll have to think of this. So as you see, I'm running an argument by contradiction. So I don't have this bound. Then I find point. Thank you. Question. So, so, so I think in the Hamiltonian case, in the paper of uh, Ginsburg Guriel, so they uh, have this uh, lower bound of uh, crossing energy for hyperbolic fixed points. This yes. is true for the. Yes, but the, 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 so uh, at this level of details, the proofs are similar. Uh, the hyperbolicity is not, doesn't matter. Uh, it's all they need is, is this isolating neighborhood. Oh, it's not. And again, in here, it's perhaps not so transparent by the way I explained the proof, but I'm also not, not using the, the hyperbolicity. The only thing I use hyperbolicity for is that if gamma is hyperbolic, this is exactly linear. Okay. And then I can I have it to be more precise on the, on the behavior of the index. But that's, that's all I need. For instance, you could have like no hyperbolicity away from the periodic orbits. And, uh, uh, no, that's fine with the assumption, but yeah. So I just need the assumption on the index. All right, if there are no more questions, let's make Marco again.